This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The tragedy of Gallipoli so shook the nations of Australia and New Zealand that for a century it's cast a giant shadow over what happened next. And what happened next cost the lives of five times as many Anzacs as Gallipoli. And they died here. I'm Neil Pickett, an actor whose family has served in nearly every conflict since World War I, which has left me with a lifelong passion for military history. This was the main theatre of the First World War. This was the only place where the war could be won. And what happened here changed us and the world. I'm Dr Peter Patterson, military historian, former Australian Army Battalion Commander and former Assistant Director of the Australian War Memorial. In this series, we'll find out how significant a part the Anzacs played in deciding the outcome of the First World War here on the Western Front. In the last episode, we saw the Anzacs fighting in an area dominated by one of the major rivers, Picardy, the Somme. In this episode, we follow the Anzacs through one of the most momentous years of the 20th century. It's 1917, and after the failure of the Somme offensive to produce a breakthrough, the French appointed a new commander-in-chief, General Robert Nivelle, an apostle of the attack. Nivelle planned a big offensive for April on the Chemin des Dames, and he loudly promised success. He wanted Haig, headquartered near the French coast and commanding the smaller British Expeditionary Force to draw in the German reserves by mounting a subsidiary offensive at Arras. In support of the Arras offensive, the Anzacs advanced towards Papone. And strangely, they met with comparatively little resistance because in late February 1917, the bulk of the German forces had withdrawn 50 kilometres to the seemingly impregnable fortifications of the Hindenburg Line. As grim as 1916 had been for the Allies, it had been equally hard for the Germans, who fell back. The Anzacs, encouraged by the fall of Bapam, followed. Their goal, a town along the Hindenburg Line known as Bulacor. Two Australian columns left Bapam on the 18th of March, across an eight kilometre front. Initially, they met with success, the so-called German outpost villages designed to slow the Australian advance were lightly defended and fell easily. But resistance stiffened the further the Australians went. And then on the 20th of March, something else fell. Snow. And in that snow, the Australians attacked the more heavily defended villages of Lanyacor and Noray. Advancing behind a creeping barrage on the 26th of March, the South Australian 27th Battalion secured the spur between Nuray and Lanyacor, while the 26th from Queensland took Lanyacor itself. On the 2nd of April, Nuray also fell. But before the Australians could attack Bulacor itself, they had to take this village, Hermi. It was the strongest of the remaining outpost villages, and the assault on it was timed for 3.30 on the morning of the 9th of April. By 6 a.m., Ermi was captured. The Germans withdrew and the three weeks of relatively open warfare was over. But then, on the 11th of April, the battle for Bulacor began. And it was the beginning of a fluctuating battle that would last for just over a month. What happened on the 11th at Bulacor has been described repeatedly and officially. It is the word used in the British official history as a fiasco. A fiasco that cost the lives of almost twice as many Australians as the entire Vietnam conflict. After a false start and despite deplorable weather conditions, the 4th Division attacked the Hindenburg Line at Bulacor at 4.30am. Attacks always followed a heavy barrage, which was intended to cut the enemy's wire. 
But when the atrocious weather conditions delayed that artillery, General Goff, who was in charge of planning the assault, seized on the idea of using tanks instead. Some of the tanks, blinded by a snowstorm, failed to reach the start line. Others broke down or were hit by shellfire. William McHugh didn't know much about tanks, but he knew that if you saw them, you were at the pointy end of the battle. I said to Jimmy Major, we must be near the front line. Look at these, they're tanks. And I hadn't got the words out of my mouth, and a bullet went psh, past my head like that. And we jumped into a trench, and he shelled us with everything. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. The Australians had never worked with tanks before. Tanks were also still relatively new weapons and mechanically unreliable. Albert Jacker, already livid at the late arrival of the tanks, had to be restrained from shooting the crew of one that got stuck just prior to the attack. The tanks failed, and that meant the Australian 4th Division was attacking the Hindenburg Line with no support barrage, and the German wire was almost intact. The 4th Brigade, on the right of the Central Road, was caught in a cyclone of fire. One of the war's great Australian soldiers, Major Percy Black, screamed out, Bugger the tanks, boys! and led the 16th Battalion through the wire before he was killed. The Battalion War Diary later recorded, we went into the attack with a fighting strength of 17 officers and 700 other ranks. We came out again with three officers and 97 other ranks. Private Wilfred Galway wrote of the scene, some dropped in the middle of the wire and hung there like scarecrows, wounded and helpless, only to be riddled. Others got entangled and escape was out of the question. They were like birds in a snare and just had to stand there until bullets ended their suffering. And things only got worse. On the left was the 46th Battalion, half of whom were Gallipoli veterans. They were shot up by friendly fire from a disorientated tank. They had no hope of reaching Bullecourt as planned. And this meant the Germans were free to rake their exposed flank across open ground. Despite the tank's failure, the Australians still managed to enter and hold a section of the Hindenburg Line to Bullecourt South, just short of Riencourt. Of that situation, Captain Harry Murray said, with artillery support, we can hold this position till the cows come home. Isolated as they were, their position was tenuous and despite repeated requests, they were denied that artillery support because their own observers, deceived by snowfall, thought they were actually in the village, when in fact the Germans were counter-attacking from there. Now, General Goff, who was in command, accepted those false reports, and he sent the cavalry in. Men and horses were destroyed. Meanwhile, the Australians were marooned in the Hindenburg Line, 500 metres short of Riencourt, running out of men and ammunition and constantly counter-attacked by some of the best troops in the German army, they were forced to give up the positions they'd paid so dearly to win. So we've got the place blanketed in snow, we've got tanks that aren't operating properly. I mean, what sort of an effect do you think that that's having on the Australians now in Bullecourt? Well, I think it would have had much the same effect as, say, Pozier. It was a terrible battle in which the prospects of success were marginal. And it's very significant that after First Bullet Corps, the British Army used it as an example of how an attack should not be undertaken. And I think the Australians, by this stage, knew enough to realise that the way it was being conducted, what they were being asked to do, was very suspect, very dubious. Do you think the failure of the tanks here in Bullecourt, did that create a long-term mistrust 
from the Australian point of view in the use of tanks? Most certainly. After Bullecourt, the Australians didn't want a bar of tanks. In fact, at Messine, when they were offered tanks, mm. they said, no, we'll give them to the uh, New Zealanders. But let's be clear, the tanks were unreliable, they were old, they were under-armoured, and they didn't have the capability to do the job that they were being asked to do. Now, despite the tanks failing, the Australians actually did get into the Hindenburg Line. That's right. The 4th Brigade is holding the, the Hindenburg line and Harry Murray is sending up signal rocket after signal rocket to the artillery, but there's no artillery support forthcoming and Murray sees the torrent of fire that the Germans are pouring across no man's land and he turns to his men and says, it's either capture or go through that. And that was typical of Murray. During the attack, young Lance Corporal Bert Knowles, one of the many soldiers who looked up to Murray, said, and there was Murray, just strolling along as if death was only something that came through old age. The losses at Bullecourt had been appalling. Against 749 German casualties, the 4th Division lost almost 3,500 men. Over 1,000 men had been taken prisoner, the greatest number of Australians to be captured in a single day in the war. The first battle of Bullecourt had been a fiasco but it paled in comparison to the disaster brewing in the south. Four days after First Bullet Corps, on April the 16th, the French offensive under General Robert Nobel began, with 19 French divisions assaulting on the Chemin des Dames to the south. Barely four weeks later, Nobel's offensive had failed, and the French army had suffered 187,000 casualties. And this initiated a wave of mutinies, and so General Nivelle was relieved of his command. Subsequently, the balance of power in the Alliance had shifted and the British would now take the lead. But unlike the battered French, Haig had no desire to sit tight and defend. Concerned that French offensive spirit was waning, Haig sought to prop it up by continuing the British offensive at Arras. That meant another tilt at Bullecourt. The Australian line at Bullecourt followed the line of this railway embankment and in the early hours of the 3rd of May, the battle was on again. The Australian 2nd and the British 62nd Divisions were attacking the Hindenburg line on the other side of these fields. On the Australian's right, the 19th Battalion veered off line, exposing a gap between it and the 17th with fatal results. The Australian line was severely mauled. Private Bill Richardson recalled the chaos and devastation. Yeah, a colonel, he had a brother, a shell had caught him direct and blew him into pieces. Then he got a bag, he went around picking up the pieces of his brother. Two Victorian battalions, the 23rd and 24th, were sheltered by the high ground and they reached the Hindenburg line with little loss. On their left, the 21st and 22nd battalions were pinned down at the wire, and before nine o'clock, the Germans were counter-attacking. They were thrown back, and it was tit for tat between them and the Australians after that. Bullecourt, which the British were to capture, still held out. On the 4th of May, the 1st and 3rd New South Welsh battalions bombed their way along the Hindenburg line, almost 200 metres closer to Bullecourt. German counter-attacks, one using flamethrowers, were repulsed. Sergeant Patrick Kinchington, a 28-year-old from Roma in Queensland, was amongst the first to see the new weapon in action. He said, I saw a fellow fire a jet of flame into the bank. It was the first flammenwerfer I had seen. I fired and shot the carrier in the belly. The fighting continued into the night. The 1st Battalion's war diary recorded that at 9pm, enemy launched strong counter-attack on our left and on our 3rd Battalion, which was driven out leaving our left flank exposed. On the 12th of May, Lieutenant Rupert Moon, leading his men, although he'd already been shot in the face, shouted, come on, boys, don't turn me down. Finally, the Australians reached the eastern side of Bullecourt, the British having entered it from the west earlier, and Moon received the Victoria Cross. Battered for two weeks, the Germans pulled back to new positions behind the Hindenburg line. Haig was unstinting in his praise of the Australians. 
The Australian capture and defence of the double trench line through two weeks of almost constant fighting deserves to be remembered as a most gallant feat of arms. But this feat had not been without cost and the upcoming campaign in Belgium would sorely test not only the Anzacs resolve, but General Haig's as well. The mauling of Nivelle's French on the Chemin de Dame and the subsequent mutinies within the French army left Haig and the British as the senior partners in the coalition. And this meant that he could implement his preferred strategy. So on the 7th of May, he announced his intention to throw the weight of the British forces against the Germans around this place, Ypres. Now, because of the strategic value of the high ground around here, Ypres had already seen war. The first Battle of Ypres in 1914 and the second as the Anzacs were going ashore on Gallipoli in 1915. In 1917, the British would fight the third Battle of Ypres and the Anzacs would be involved. The preliminary objective, a ridge just 80 metres high, immediately south of the Ypres salient, but commanding the communications into it, was to be assaulted on the 7th of June. On that day, a new name would be inscribed in Anzac battle honours, Messines. The Battle of Messines was characterised by some of the most meticulous planning of the war. For months, Allied tunnellers had been digging to lay explosives underneath German positions, and the battle commenced with the detonation of 19 of those Allied mines, with the Australian 3rd Division set to participate in the offensive that followed. They were to be commanded by a Gallipoli veteran who would go on to prove himself the finest Australian general of any war. His name was John Monash, and his division was tested very early on as it had to move up for the attack through a drenching German gas bombardment. One of the weapons that will forever be associated with the horrors of that war that grips our imaginations as one of the most terrible weapons ever invented is poison gas. Henry Parkinson was a 23-year-old railway worker from Sydney. This is what happened to him. And all of a sudden there was a blast. It was a shrapnel shell, but it had a certain amount of gas in it. Liquid gas spilt onto our legs a bit, you know, and I could feel the pain and my eyes began to sting and I couldn't hardly see out of them. In the course of the war, gas developed from simple tear gas to mustard gas and phosgene, asphyxiating, burning, lethal chemicals. The outcome of Western Front battles rarely hinged on the use of gas, its horrors notwithstanding. Despite the gas, the 3rd Division was in position when the mines went up at 3.10am. In addition to the mines which left craters like this one at Spanbrook Mollen, the advance would proceed behind a creeping barrage 650 metres deep, laid down by 2,300 guns and 300 heavy mortars. Not surprisingly, Major General Tim Harrington, the Second Army's Chief of Staff, remarked the evening before the attack, gentlemen, we may not make history tomorrow, but we shall certainly change the geography. Reportedly, the bombardment could be heard in London, 190 kilometres away. And it's estimated that 10,000 Germans were obliterated in just 30 seconds. Captain Robert Grieve of the 37th Battalion witnessed the carnage. It would be impossible in words to describe the inferno. The earth seemed to vomit fire and was shaken as though by an earthquake. The explosions in the barrage had so shaken the Germans that Major Arthur Maudsley reported, the enemy would not stand up to us. We gained our objective without a great deal of resistance, said Captain Cyril Malloy of the Otago Rifles. The Hun, almost without exception, surrendering everywhere. The Battle of Messines began brilliantly, with Germans surrendering in droves and relatively few casualties. But as the Allies pressed on, the resistance stiffened and the human cost would soar. Having suffered greatly at Bullecourt, the Australians were now having better success at Messines. After a ferocious bombardment and the devastating destruction caused by the detonation of the mines, German resolve was wavering. And so the Anzacs surged forward towards their two objectives. 
The first objective, the so-called black line, was reached by 5.15 in the morning with relative ease and the Kiwis established outposts ahead of it to protect the troops that were moving up for the next phase of the assault. The attack on the Oosterburn line, a kilometre further on. But the Germans detected the build-up and the 4th Australian Division came under heavy artillery fire as it moved up for the second phase of the assault. That second phase was much more heavily fought than the first. Reinforced concrete pillboxes, untouched by the bombardment and encountered by the Australians for the first time, poured torrential machine gun fire into the assault. When the attack reached the Blower Port Peak stream in the low ground behind me, the left of the 45th Battalion here and the 49th Battalion astride the stream were pinned down by intense fire from this and other fortifications. Every officer in the 45th and every company commander in the 49th was killed. The men had been told not to use the word retire. What had begun as a well-executed battle and a capture of the ridge behind me was now becoming more than a little bit muddled. The Australians failed to fire flares signalling their position because they were afraid the Germans would see where they were. As a consequence, their own supporting artillery fired a barrage that hit them. One unit diary reported, enemy delivered a counter-attack in force, and at the same time, our barrage came down on our trench, which we were occupying. This was withstood for some time, the attack being repulsed, but it was deemed desirable to fall back. Despite the Anzacs' retreat from the Oosterverne line, most of the ground was retaken the next day, and by the 11th of June, the Germans withdrew. The British press hailed it as the most sweeping and most brilliant victory by British arms since the war began, and we can probably forgive them their bluster, because good news was in short supply, and there was more bad news just around the corner. With the capture of Messines Ridge, Haig could enact the next phase of the Third Battle of Ypres. This would be marked by some of the most controversial actions of the First World War. And for the Anzacs, this bloody campaign would lead them to battlefields whose names have become immortal. Menin Road, Polygon Wood, Sender, and finally, Passchendaele. The Anzac's first task was to advance the line running off the Menin Road onto the start of that high ground, along which ran the German line overlooking the salient to the north. The Anzac started here. The Battle of the Menin Road also marked a couple of firsts. It was the first time that two Australian divisions had fought side by side, and also the first time that the Australians had spearheaded an offensive. Subsequently, the Anzac's morale was sky high. Sergeant Percy Lay of the 8th Battalion stated, It was very amusing to see the way our chaps went into battle. It looked more like a race meeting. A good few got caught by our own barrage by being too eager to get forward. After the worst summer rains in 30 years, the night before the attack went in on September the 20th, rain fell steadily. And low-lying ground such as this in the area of the Hannabeek stream, which is now crossed by a motorway and quite boggy, became really waterlogged again. The assault was preceded by a five-day bombardment which commenced on the 15th of September. Nearly 1,300 Allied guns poured three and a half million shells into the Germans. The attack commenced on the 20th of September behind a creeping barrage across a three and a half kilometre front either side of the Menin Road with 1st Anzac as its spearhead. In his memoirs, General Erich Ludendorff, effectively the German commander-in-chief, recalled that in spite of all concrete protection, our troops seemed more or less powerless under the enormous weight of the enemy's artillery. At some points, they no longer displayed the firmness that I had hoped for. The War Diary of the 7th Battalion detailed the evidence of the Germans' hasty retreat. In this dugout were large bunks and much equipment, packs rolled, bags of bread, service water bottles filled with wine, and on the table, breakfast spread and candle burning. <laughs> 
Although the bombardment was successful, the mud and the defences still exacted a telling toll on the Anzacs, as Private Alfred Stabb remembers. All along that road there was gun carriages, vans, all types of vehicles that had been hit and been pushed to one side. Our little company went in about 30 odd strong and six of us came out. If the Somme had taught the Allies some lessons about attack, it had also taught the Germans something about defence. And the difficulties the Anzacs were now facing around Ypres were due in part to a new German concept, elastic defence. The Germans structured the defence in great depth, dividing the battlefield into defensive zones through which the attackers would be drawn until, increasingly weakened, they were ripe for counter-attack. Evidence of that strategy can still be seen here on the battlefield where the German defences were strengthened by blockhouses, artillery shelters like these ones, and as many as 2,000 concrete pillboxes. Despite the use of these new defensive tactics, the German defenders were still overcome. And in five hours, the Australians had reached all of their objectives and the gunners put paid to German plans for a counter-attack. The battle of the men in road was over. Australian gunners, moving to new positions on this battlefield some days later, were captured in one of official photographer Frank Hurley's most famous shots. The men in road attack had met with success, but with total Allied casualties of over 20,000, success had come at a price. But what lay ahead would exact a much greater toll as the advanced reached places whose names have an almost unrivaled notoriety in the story of the First World War. In the last episode, we followed the successful but costly Australian advance from the Menin Road. In this episode, we continue the story of what made 1917 the costliest year in terms of human life in our military history. The Australian divisions that had been in action on the Menin Road were relieved by fresh Australian divisions and they would attack on the 26th of September. Their objective, this place, Polygon Wood. Polygon Wood was just one battle in a campaign known as the Third Battle of Ypres. Spearheading that campaign, the Anzacs experienced a cataclysm, culminating at the Belgian town of Passchendaele. Seven Allied divisions were committed to an assault in two phases planned for September 26th. The first, an 800 metre advance to the Red Line. The second, a further 360 metre advance to the Blue Line. But the movement of troops and supplies alerted the Germans to the proposed attack and they decided to get in first. And following a withering barrage on the 25th of September, they attacked. They captured ground on the southern side of Polygon Wood from the British division that was next to the 15th Australian Brigade. The 15th Brigade promptly stabilised the situation, but the effort and its cost made its commander, Brigadier General Pompey Elliott, doubt whether it could participate in the attack on the wood, which was scheduled for next day. But it was too late to change the plan. On the 26th of September, the barrage opened, as Captain Arthur Ellis said, in one magnificent crash with one gun for every nine metres of front. Frederick Farrell was a farm labourer before the war. He was only 19 at the time, and many years later, unsurprisingly, his memory was razor sharp. At six o'clock in the morning, we were to launch the attack on Polygon Wood. So up we went, but the Germans, I suppose, knew full well what was on, and we were subjected to a merciless barrage. Dust raised by the barrage on the high ground, which was still relatively dry, combined with morning fog to reduce visibility, making control difficult. And so the advance proceeded in less than an orderly fashion. Lieutenant Sinclair Hunt, a school teacher from Singleton, wrote, The fog was dense and sections became very restless as they fixed bayonets and prepared to advance. A gun boomed louder than the rest and, as at the touch of an enchantress's wand, out of the ground sprang a mass of men in little worm-like columns. 4,000 men 
dashed forward at a run. The assault had begun. Hague's strategy, so costly of human life, has been repeatedly criticised. But the German General Ludendorff wrote of that day, we might be able to stand the loss of ground, but the reduction of our fighting strength was again all the heavier. The war of attrition was having an effect. Frederick Farrell explained what happened to him. When our artillery made their attack, I'd lost my rifle. As a matter of fact, I'd nearly lost my senses. But it wasn't long before I could pick one up easy enough. And so I just started off across no man's land in a sort of a haze. The 53rd was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Oswald Crowshaw, a man who believed in leading from the front. And before the attack, he addressed his officers. He said, your men before yourselves. Look to your flanks. God bless you all till we meet again. Sadly, he was killed at the head of his battalion. The advance on this part of the line was relatively easy. Elsewhere, the 15th Brigade ended up capturing most of the British objective as well as its own. And Albert Jacker rallied his men and led them on after a barrage unsettled them. The war diary of the 14th Battalion, by now known as Jacker's Mob, said... Report received from left company that enemy massing for counter-attack. SOS sent up, our barrage came down very quickly, attack completely repulsed. Sergeant John Dwyer in the same action knocked out a machine gun post and was awarded the VC. Unhesitatingly, he rushed his gun forward to within 30 yards of the enemy gun and fired point blank at it. The 15th Brigade secured the right flank and the rest of the Australian attack was relatively uneventful. Artillery and machine gun fire smashed the German counter-attack before it got going. But on either side of the Australians, the British formations ran into difficulties and couldn't get as far forward. Despite being relatively uneventful, Polygon Wood still cost 15,000 casualties, a third of the Manzacs, and it wasn't without its horrors. 18-year-old Leslie Mackay was a plasterer before the war. He would later write, My God, it was terrible, just slaughter. We gained our objective, but what a cost. Mates I have played with last night are now lying cold. One of the myths of the Western Front is that no lessons were learned, that nothing changed, that the high command persisted with flawed tactics. But the truth is that lessons were learned about handling massive armies, dealing with incredible firepower, complex defence systems on the battlefield, aircraft above it, tanks across it. For the infantry, each division now advanced on a narrow frontage, not with units compressed, but arranged in echelon, in depth. The first objective would be reached after a very short advance. The second objective would be even closer, and so on. At each objective, fresh troops would join the attack as echelons moved up, so the attack would always remain strong. These tactics had been used on the men in road, here at Polygon Wood, and in the other battles in the Ypres salient to come. After the fall of Polygon Wood, the next step along the ridge that dominated the Ypres salient, the next bite and hold, would aim at a place called Brutsenda. The third battle of Ypres came down to pushing the Ypres salient eastward, and Brutsenda had a very special tactical value for whoever controlled it. The Brutsenda assault would be the only time that the two Anzac Corps fought side by side and it would be the biggest set-piece assault involving Australians and New Zealanders until the second half of 1918. It would cost them over 8,000 casualties and they would take over 4,500 Germans prisoner. This is the Belgian town of Brutsenda and in the sequence of actions that advanced the Third Battle of Ypres, this insignificant crossroad was particularly important because from here the Germans commanded a clear panoramic view of virtually the entire salient. But in October 1917, this was not a particularly scenic panorama. Poor drainage near constant drizzle and incessant fighting had taken their toll on the landscape, and by the time the Allied barrage commenced, much of the battlefield was a sea of mud. <laughs> 
The British barrage was falling on the Germans, the rain was falling on everybody, the Australians, Baynard's fixed, advanced, and then something extraordinary happened. As the first Anzac rose to attack on the other side of this field, they saw a line of Germans just here do exactly the same thing. Both the Anzac and the Germans had planned, bombarded for, and launched an attack virtually simultaneously. The Germans to retake the high ground of Polygon Wood, the Anzacs to take the high ground at Brutsender. But the German attack was simply brushed aside by the ferocity of the Anzac assault. One war diary said, information later obtained from prisoners showed that our attack anticipated the one he intended making by only quarter of an hour. There was resistance from clusters of concrete pillboxes which made for difficult progress, and Victoria Crosses were won for actions against these posts. One by one, the machine guns were dealt with, and the momentum of the attack was maintained, though not without difficulty. In a harbinger of what was to come, the War Diary of the 40th reported, on moving from the first to the second objective, the ground became very wet and boggy. The enemy's barrage, which up until this time had been badly directed, now began causing casualties. Nonetheless, the War Diary of the 37th Battalion tells us... The appealing cry of comrade was heard, and groups of pale-faced, frightened Huns with hands raised hurried towards our lines. Australian units were now on the high ground, and where they had a view that gave them ample warning of German counter-attacks, which the artillery could then scatter. As the Australians assaulted the main ridge, the New Zealand division on their left flank launched an attack on Grafenstaffel Spur, and their divisional commander, General Sir Andrew Russell, is widely reported to have complained, the mud is a worse enemy than the German. The Australians achieved their objectives along Brute Centre Ridge, while the Kiwis advanced one kilometre and secured the spur at the cost of more than 300 lives. A man named Dave Gallagher was among those killed. Gallagher was 44 years old and had captained the All Black Originals on their 1905-6 tour of Britain and France. He was one of 13 All Blacks to be killed in the First World War. After a battle like Brute Sender, casualties were not the only logistical issue. It was a fight in which the two Anzac Corps took more than 4,500 prisoners. Private Schwinghammer recalled the welcome those prisoners got. As they passed us, they were relieved of any valuables that they possessed, souveniring the enemy being a strong characteristic of the Australians. Those souvenirs could be exchanged, traded for something useful, like tobacco. Plenty found their way home where they still lie in drawers and boxes, dusty reminders of a brutal conflict. It's the middle of 1917. The Anzacs have been here for 18 months. They're different soldiers now, aren't they? Quite literally. That's because the training has improved. Battalions and brigades are sent through and they spend two weeks working on pillbox fighting techniques. And it had been worked out how many guns you would need to cut a certain length of wire, to destroy or neutralise a certain length of trench. So all of these things have come into play and they're increasing the effectiveness of soldiers who are good soldiers in the first place. The fact that they were now being commanded by men that knew the ropes, that must have been a real morale boost for your average soldier. Most certainly. At Gallipoli, there were a number of battalion commanders who were in their 50s or late 50s. By the time you get to 1917, battalion commanders were in their 30s and some, I think, are even in their 20s. Mm. So they'd once been in the position of the men that they were commanding. If you're going to follow somebody into a situation where you could be killed, you obviously want to know the leaders will give you the best possible chance of it because they know what's involved and they've been through it themselves. But by this time, there'd been a mental change in the Anzacs, hadn't there? Yes, being the official historian. And he said something along the lines, there's only one way out of this war for an infantryman, and that's on his back, either sick, wounded or dead. They'll be put out to fight and fight and fight again, until if not in this battle, then in the next, each man gets his bullet. The nature of the fighting here was such that men realised they had very little chance of getting through it unscathed. So they turn inwards and their mates become important. The section, the platoon, the company, the battalion, that's the family. And that bond is a tremendous sort of inspirational and motivational force. The line was now close to the outskirts of this village. 
Now, it may well have been called the Third Battle of Ypres, but for many people, this village has lent its name to that campaign. This is Passchendaele. Passchendaele is remembered as one of the most controversial battles of the First World War, and it exploded across this landscape on October 9th, 1917. I'm on the main ridge, short of Passchendaele. Another feature, the Bellevue Spur, parallels the ridge on the far side of the Ravbeek Valley. The attack would therefore have to be two-pronged. If the two prongs got out of step, or if one failed, then the other would be exposed to and destroyed by devastating enfilade fire from the flanking high ground. Continuing the bite and hold formula on narrow frontages, the attack was designed to secure a series of objectives a short distance apart, culminating at the edge of Passchendaele. But what looked achievable on the map was far from that in reality. It rained, it deluged, and the poorly drained terrain reverted to clinging mud. Charles Gatliff, a Boer War veteran, recalled, it's a common sight to see men pulling one another out of the mud. It clings like glue. The first effect of this was to compromise the artillery bombardment. Many guns simply couldn't be brought into position because of the state of the ground. And in the end, only about a quarter of the usual number of guns supported the attack. What's more, many shells simply landed with a splash and disappeared into the mud without exploding. One of the desired outcomes of any barrage was to cut the enemy's wire, but with so many shells failing to detonate, when the infantry did rise from their positions, they found themselves advancing on German wire that was, by and large, intact. Second Anzac's two British divisions, the 49th and 66th, advanced at the southern end of the attack with units from 1st Anzac securing their right flank. The 49th failed against the uncut wire and concrete pillboxes on Bellevue Spur, exposing the 66th in front of Passchendaele to devastating enfilade fire. At the end of the day, all 2nd Anzac had to show for its efforts was a substantial casualty count. Field Marshal Haig's verdict? It was simply the mud that defeated us. The men did splendidly. Thomas Cleary, an electrician from Sydney, was there. Pouring rain with no shelter, no tucker, and told to do the best we could. And I put in easily the worst night I ever did or expect to put in. If it wasn't for the thought I was on active service, I think I would have wasted a cartridge on myself. It was more than rain grinding men down. The conditions were unimaginable. With dead and dying bodies rotting in the foul mud, the stench at the front was appalling. And these men lived there. They shared their lives with rats that feasted on the flesh of corpses and grew to the size of cats. They shared their clothes with lice. Virtually every man had them. And the infestation caused a disease. They called it trench fever. But the worst condition was trench foot. Lieutenant Semple, a 26-year-old accountant from Sydney, wrote, I am suffering from trench feet as a result of having been in knee-deep water for 72 hours without a break. The cold and the wet caused a loss of circulation, and this led to a fungal infection, which could in turn lead to gangrene. Keeping your feet dry was absolutely essential, but virtually impossible. Because of the mud and the defences, the attack on the 9th of October had failed. But there was no question of calling a halt to the proceedings. Quite the reverse. The next attack would have to take the ground that the attack on the 9th had failed to capture, as well as Passchendaele itself. The drive from Broodsender had been a failure, but Haig, misled by some reports and not in receipt of others, was persuaded that it had been a reasonable success. And so he ordered the implementation of the next phase of 30, the attack on Passchendaele. And that decision remains one of the most controversial of the entire Western Front campaign. The next stage of the attack began on October the 12th, after another 14 millimetres of rain had fallen. The 3rd Australian Division was to assault along the Passchendaele Ridge with a brigade from the 4th Australian Division supporting its right. On its left, the New Zealand Division was to attack along the Bellevue Spur. 
In the low ground between the New Zealanders and the third division was the Ravbeek stream, now a muddy morass 45 metres wide. The official history of the 40th Battalion described the lie of the land as an expanse of shell holes filled with water. In places, it looked like a series of lakes. Each division was to advance one and a half kilometres, but the 3rd Division's plan was based on inaccurate reporting, and in the end, its advance was to be over two kilometres, much too far for a limited bite and hole. So the 3rd Division ended up facing the longest Australian advance of the campaign in the worst conditions of the campaign. One war diary described a devastating scene. There are many men who were lost, lost altogether in the bog. Rain, high explosives and gas rained down. The New Zealanders on Bellevue Spur were smashed against perfectly intact German wire. Their casualty count remains the worst single day's tally in New Zealand's military history. The Australian 40th Battalion recorded what it saw. The New Zealanders were coming up on our left in two magnificent waves. They were seen there all that day still in two waves lying dead in the mud in front of the uncut wire. Private McCumba recalled that battle. The New Zealanders couldn't get through, and as soon as we got past, Fitzy started sniping us. We had no cover at all. They must have killed half the section. Untroubled German machine guns on the Bellevue Spur tore into the Australians, who were attacking on the right of the New Zealanders and labouring through knee-deep mud in the low ground of the Ravbeek Valley beside me. The Australians pressed on, and a party of 20 men reached Passchendaele, but they had to turn back when they realised they were alone. The end of the battle was described by Sir Douglas Haig in his dispatch. The valleys of the streams were found to be impassable, he wrote. It was therefore determined not to persist in the attack, and the advance towards our more distant objectives was cancelled. It's little wonder, then, that Major General John Monash complained how men are being put into the hottest fighting and are being sacrificed in harebrained schemes like Bullocor and Passchendaele. Many of these men had simply drowned in the mud. Many more died on stretches, which in the quagmire could take their bearers up to six hours to travel one kilometre. The number of casualties per metre of ground gained is one measure of the cost effectiveness of battles. At Messine and Brood Sender, the cost was one man per metre of ground gained. At Passchendaele, the cost was 35 men per metre of ground gained. And many of the dead from the battle are buried here at Tynecott Cemetery, the largest Commonwealth war grave cemetery in the world. The battered Australians withdrew and they were replaced in the line by another Dominion force, the Canadians. They wrote a magnificent page in their history for actions between the 26th of October and the 20th of November, where they captured and finally held Passchendaele Ridge. But it wasn't without a cost. 4,000 killed and nearly twice as many wounded. One of the most bitterly fought political battles of the war was between British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and his Commander-in-Chief, Douglas Haig. The two men seemed to have detested each other and Lloyd George devoted pages in his post-war memoirs to vilifying the Field Marshal. Of Passchendaele wrote, no soldier of any intelligence now defends this senseless campaign. But the attritional tactics was also having a profound effect on the enemy. General Ludendorff wrote, the wastage was extraordinarily high and in the West we began to be short of troops. And in a publication the German High Command said of that senseless campaign, Germany had been brought to near destruction by the Flanders Battle of 1917. Haig's strategy had very nearly worked. After their withdrawal from Passchendaele, the Anzac units were reorganised. The Australians were formed into the Australian Corps, and the Kiwis went off to 22nd Corps. The third Battle of Ypres ended here in Passchendaele, but there remains one action of 1917 that we should describe because although the Australians and New Zealanders weren't involved, 
the lessons learned at Cambrai would shape the battles that they fought in the year ahead. Cumbrai lies 120 kilometres south of Passchendaele and it was here that tanks played an influential role for the first time. More than 300 attacked en masse. New artillery developments and infantry tactics that would prove effective in the year ahead were also employed. That attack went further in six hours than 3rd Ypres had in three months and with half the casualties. Cumbrai was proof that technology was becoming as crucial on the battlefield as manpower and would significantly influence the battles to come. The start of 1918, the Western Front, gripped by winter, was quiet. There was little thought amongst the Allies that this would be the last year of the war. Many expected 1919 or even 1920 to decide the issue when the trickle of Americans that had started after America declared war in 1917 would become a flood. But this reason, the Germans had to act decisively. So, in the spring of 1918, just months after the Canadians had captured Passchendaele, the Germans launched one last desperate throw of the dice. And the British were forced to give up not only Passchendaele, but other dearly fought gains in the Ypres area in the face of what was a devastating German onslaught that almost brought success. 